Up next, before these AOR legends had two number one hits on one of the biggest rock albums ever, they had two songs that were stepping stones to massive appeal. The lead singer of this celebrated rock band tells us the story of the rise of his group and these two songs that really changed the band's fortunes and put them on the fast track. Stories next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now, if you long for the days where we used to listen to the album, song by song, as a complete work instead of a shuffled playlist, then this channel was made definitely for you. Just subscribe below right now for our daily content. You never know who we're gonna have on the show. That's why it's fun to watch every day. And make sure to check out our new merch, including our brand new Vintage Years collection where we have the big four of a classic year in music. Characters are drawn by famous artist Thomas Estrada. Check these out, this is really cool. We also have an exclusive content at our Patreon. Uh, both of these things help us to curate this channel, produce more interviews, more videos, uh, so check that out. So it's time for another edition of our show, Breakthrough, where we break down uh, the singular song, album, or event that uh, kicked open the door to an artist or band's career and uh, you know gave them the momentum, that uh, momentum to rocket to long-term success. Now, before Ario Speedwagon exploded to number one on the singles charts uh, with Keep On Loving You, and then Can't Fight This Feeling. This the band uh, were trying to build some momentum. They had actually languished as a band for years. They'd certainly paid their dues, building an audience through touring, uh, mostly through the Midwest to start out. Uh, REO Speedwagon actually came out of an impromptu jam session between Neil Doty and Alan Gratzer in 1966. Band members came and went, but in 1970, a guitarist named Gary Richrath came aboard. Uh, with their equipment being hauled to dates in a friend's station wagon, the band frequented bars and clubs, like I said, all over the Midwest. And they released their debut album, REO Speedwagon, on Epic Records. That was in 1971. From the time that Gary Richrath, the great Gary Richrath, came into the band, the lineup uh, remained pretty stable from there, with the exception of lead vocalist over their first three albums. Vocalist Terry Luttrell uh, left the band in the first part of 1972. He would go on to sing for the band Star Castle. Uh, he was replaced by uh, one Kevin Cronin. Cronin recorded one album with the band, REO TWO, but he ended up leaving the band during the sessions for 1973's Riding the Storm Out uh, because of conflicts within the group. Uh, Riding the Storm Out was completed with Michael Brian Murphy on lead vocal. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, he would stay on with REO for two more records, Lost in a Dream and This Time We Mean It. But from there, Kevin Cronin returned. That was in January of 1976 and recorded REO which was released uh, that same year. This is where REO Speedwagon started to really ignite. In 1977, REO convinced Epic Records that their real power was in their live shows. Uh, Epic allowed them to produce their first live album, uh, You Get What You Play For, which would go platinum long-term and uh, with the road being paved by their great songs. Uh, members of the band actually at that time moved out to California. It was really coming, coming true for them. From there, they started to you know, bubble up as they started to work on their new album that they hoped would take them to higher ground. It's of course a memorable album cover and, uh, and the name. You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. This was the album that really changed everything for this band. It was released in 1978. Over the years, two songs from that record have become true classics of uh, classic rock radio. Roll the changes. And time for me to fly. Time for me to fly. The strength of those uh, two singles really took the album to new heights as they were Ario's first to make the top 40. Very fortunate to, to sit down with lead singer Kevin Crone and have a long ranging conversation about it their entire career. He gave me the story behind this classic album and the song's role with the changes. Actually, my favorite, uh, personal favorite, Ario Speedwagon song, And Time For Me To Fly, another great one. What follows is the breakthrough story of that. And as we go into this interview, 
I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses I'm wearing now, I'm always wearing. Go take a look at zenny.com where you can design your own glasses and do a virtual try-on. This is where you can see exactly how the eyewear is going to look on you before you buy. You can make sure it matches your face. You can actually uh, try on different pairs. Really cool. It's Zenny's virtual mirror feature. And while you're at it, you can add cool features like blue blocks, which protect your eyes from digital blue light. It's been really cool for me because I look at computers all the time. Here's a story from Kevin Cronin on these great songs. As soon as you are able. I want to talk to you about you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. This record, the next record, first top 40 album, two times platinum since then. It was your first with Bruce Hall, and it also was the first that you guys co-produced, you and Gary, together. Let's talk about this album for a second, especially Roll With The Changes. That's another classic REO song that everybody loves. Tell me how that one came together and this album. Well, I mean, we, we finally you know, um, decided that we tried a bunch of different producers and the studio albums never sounded right. We had a little power going in because I had written Roll With The Changes and Time For Me To Fly. And, you know, people heard, th those were the kind of songs, there's just certain songs that the first time people hear them, they just go, yes. You know, that, oh, that yeah. and, and not every song has that kind of power. Right. But those, both of those songs did. It didn't matter who you were, didn't matter mm -hmm. if you were in the band, at the record company, every time people heard those songs, they were just like, okay. I'm in. Got, you, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> so we kind of had that going. And so Gary and I were like, well, let's, let's call a meeting and sit down with Epic and just tell them, this was our mindset, that <laughs> If you want these songs on one of your records, then we're producing it or we're walking. <laughs> that was our mindset. Right. We're idiots. We're, we're, you know. <laughs> but we walked yeah. in the meeting and that was, we kind of, we were pretty ballsy. The big wigs at Epic were there, the president of the record label, Rana Luxemburg and all his, all the brass and we're sitting there all cocky and everything. And, you know, to our surprise, they were like, okay. <laughs> we were like, wait, what? Okay. I, was, I thought there was even a fight here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Gary and I are looking at each other. We're like, now what do we do? You know, <laughs> right. we don't know how to produce now records. You what do are you it. talking about? But luckily, um, Epic had uh, John Boylan mm -hmm. on, on staff. And uh, John Boylan is one of my favorite people in the world. And he kind of was in the studio, rode shotgun and in case we needed him. And uh, so we felt pretty safe going in there and, uh, and producing that record. <laughs> So roll with the changes. How did that come about? You know, it was kind of a, um, I remember sitting in Studio B at the old record plant on Third Avenue, the, the iconic record plant, and uh, sitting at the piano and uh, just, I started doing this. Uh, let's see. Uh. just playing that riff and it kind of just one of those things that just happened and I was like oh this is kind of whatever that was that and that's where mo most songs kind of start from some thing some little thing and then it either elicits more or mm -hmm. it just lays there and uh, that one kind of stuck with me and um, a, a little later I was uh, I was literally moving from Chicago out to LA because the band had moved um, while I was out of the group. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, I guess if I want to be in the band, if I'm going to stay with them, I got to yeah. move to LA, which I didn't really want to do because I love Chicago. But I decided, all right, if I'm going to move there, I'm not going to do it on an airplane. I want to, I want to feel the earth move under my feet, <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, and I, so I drove an old blue Pinto station wagon with a uh, Ford Pinto with a U-Haul trailer in the back from Chicago to uh, LA. And somewhere around Albuquerque, that piano riff came into my head and I started just having this idea. And the only thing I had was this brown paper bag that with 
some munchies in it that I'd gotten at a truck stop. So I'm literally driving down the freeway with a with a, with a U-Haul trailer behind me and kind of jotting the words down on, on oh, this paper bag, you know, because <laughs> I was, I was literally rolling with the changes. Years later, when I became friendly with Stephen Stills, he uh, deep down believes that I copped that from uh, from Love the One You're With. I can't confirm, I didn't do it consciously. Love the One You're With is one of my favorite songs ever. And if, I, if I'm honest, that organ riff at the beginning uh, in the solo role to changes, sounds a little like Love the One You're With. So, I, you know, I didn't mean to do it, but it uh, kind of yeah. happened that way. It's time for me to fly. Time for me to fly is, it's my wife's favorite Ario song. She's always playing it. I love the song too. Tell me about where that one came from. Cause that, that's like when a girl's broken your heart, that kind of thing. Listen to that, turn it up to 11 after going through one of those first heartbreaks. And it's one of those signs just belting out. Where did that one come from? That exactly what you're saying. But it was, <laughs> it was my first heartbreak. It was my first girlfriend. I, I just had to get away from Chicago. So a friend of mine said he was driving out to Boulder and I'd never been to Colorado. I'm like, okay, let's go. And we got to this friend of mine's house and he had a, uh, he was a guitar player, one of the few guitar players that, that I knew from high school. And he had, there was a guitar sitting on his porch and I picked it up and I went to play it and I hit a chord and it sounded hideous. And the guitar was so out of tune and I just started messing around with it and I realized he had it in an open tuning, which I had never even, I didn't even know what an open tuning yeah. was. So I started messing around with it and I remembered Richie Havens in Woodstock when he played Freedom and he was mm. playing with his thumb wrapped around the top of the guitar neck. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try that. Freedom, freedom. And so I did. That's where the original riff from Time For Me To Fly came from. And uh, it was just, it was, my, it was my first breakup. So, yeah. Dolly Parton, you must have loved that version, oh. man. <laughs> you heard that version? Oh, yeah. Time for me to fly. Gotta set myself free. That version blew my mind. Man. When, <laughs> I, when I first heard it, I literally thought that it, because it basically sounds like, in a way, the REO version, you put it on the turntable and someone, instead of having it on 33 RPM, was 45 yeah. RPM. Because it just was like, I've been around for you, been up and down for you, and I just can't get in, it really. I've been around for you, been up and down for you. It was great. And as a songwriter, I will tell you, there is no, there's no greater compliment. Well, when you start the opening chords of a song and... And Time For Me To Fly, I will say, is one of those songs that in concert, when I play those first chords- They know. Y y people just- We know. People just like, you can just feel this, it's, it's, the, it's a weird thing, man. It's just the, this energy, it, the energy in the room, it just, it's one of the, the greatest feelings there is. It's- part of why I still do what I do to play yeah. live because I get to have that feeling every night and then, you know, it's my job to share it and give it back. I believe it's time for me to fly. Do you remember the first time you heard your song on the radio? You know what? I can't, I wish I could say that. I wish I had that memory. That thing you do moment. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I don't remember that, honestly. But um, to this day, when I hear one of our songs on the radio, it's something that I've never, I've never gotten blasé about. If I'm driving down the freeway, one of our songs comes on the radio, I can't help but look around at the other cars in the freeway and kind of, it's that same campfire thing. You know, I'll bet you some of these other cars are hearing this too and we're experiencing this together, <laughs> which is, which that's is awesome. why I love, that's why I love radio because it, it is, it brings people together and it's, yeah, hearing your song, hearing your own song on the radio, it's, um, I mean, I've had moments where I've, I remember one time when, uh, when Roll With The Changes came on the radio, I was driving down Ventura Boulevard and 
I can't remember exactly. I think it was right around when my first marriage was kind of starting to hemorrhage a little bit. Yeah. And I was pretty, pretty vulnerable, pretty, my emotions were pretty raw. And that song came on the radio and I just, I lost it, man. I was driving along, I, you know, hoping nobody was noticing <laughs> me. But that's the beauty of music. It can force you to, to, to feel something that you need to feel. That's why it's so important, especially today in this divisive world that we live in. When a certain song comes on, and you've written quite a few of those songs, it doesn't matter about race, religion, politics, any of that stuff. All that stuff goes out the window. It's about like, keep on loving you. Everybody's singing that exact same song yeah. and they're all connected. Yeah. It's so important. That's what we, we just cannot lose that. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment below about this great time in Ariel Speedwagon's career as they were climbing to the top. What are your memories of these songs and your picks for the, the best ARIO songs ever? Tell us in the comment section below. Share your memories. Always love to see that. And don't forget to check out our 1984 Vintage Years Collection merch, also 1971 and 1987, all dedicated to the greatest years in popular music history. If you like our content, we invite you to be a permanent part of our channel by subscribing below right now and make sure to check us out on Patreon for even more content. Help us keep the music alive, very important. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.